Good afternoon and good evening. I am Sister Rosemary Nassif from Loyola Mar Marymount University. Joyful, joyful, we gather together during Black History Month and we welcome all the diversity among us. So we invite you to put your name and diocese in the chat room for our inspiration in knowing the realities among us, the diverse realities among us, and all those whose lives we touch, the diversity of all who are a part of our Catholic education realities. All are welcome. As we join today, we are acknowledging that several of our registrants and several of our participants have requested the recordings of the past sessions. And just to let you know that all of the recordings of the past three sessions can be accessed through our toolbox link. And that link will be placed in the chat room for each of you to access. So we welcome each of you, all of us together at this time. And now we turn it over to our moderators. Joyful, joyful. Thank you, sister, very much. And welcome and hello, everyone. As we begin our fourth session of our board development virtual series, we have been so very gratified by your enthusiastic responses to our first three sessions. Your comments and questions have been outstanding. Thank you for your active and ongoing engagement. As most of you know by now, I am Heather Gossert and along with my co-moderator, Dr. Regina Haney, we are delighted to be your guides through these last three outstanding sessions on board development, which is sponsored by Loyola Marymount University in partnership with Creighton, St. Edwards and Mount St. Mary's universities. Today's presentation on intentional and exceptional government is going to be an enlightening and informative and an active, interactive one. As you have already discovered, whether you are a board member or school or province administrator, you're going to find these sessions an ongoing call to expand and enrich your professional expertise and effectiveness. Now let us begin as we begin all good things by asking God's blessing on our work. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask for an abundance of your grace and compassion as we pray for the people of the Ukraine and for all who are the victims of violence and war. We ask you in our own work to guide us as Catholic educators and leaders to have the wisdom to see and the courage to act whenever and wherever there is injustice. And to always have the interest of our young people that God has called us to serve paramount in our lives. Let us tonight and each night be open to new ideas and methodologies Give us the strength to be lifelong learners whose hearts and minds are forever open to new ideas and ways of serving this great work that you have called us by name to do. We ask you to be with us this day and every day as we learn, lead, and proclaim your holy word. Amen. Amen. Regina, before we begin our session, I know as always you have a few reminders for our participants. So why don't I turn it over to you? Yes, thank you, Heather. I have a few reminders. First of all, we wanna remind you that in lieu of session fees, we are asking that you donate to your favorite Catholic school. And those who have done that already, thank you very much. And I would like to invite you in the chat to mention that school that you donated to so far, or you plan to donate to. Secondly, Please remember, 
in order to receive a certificate of completion from Loyola Marymount University, you can miss no more than two sessions, no more than two. Thirdly, we encourage you to take the opportunity to evaluate each session. Your comments and insights have been both affirming and constructive and are very, very appreciated. The evaluation instrument can be found in the chat at the conclusion of the session. So please, we love your comments. We look forward to them because it's always about being better. Next, we welcome both comments and your questions during the session. Use the chat to send us your comments and questions. And your participation is what makes this session so valuable and so important. Remember that all of our sessions are recorded and will be available as Sister Rosemary already has mentioned. At the conclusion of this session, you'll have access to the earlier ones. If you have questions or problems, please do not hesitate to email me, rhaney at verizon.net, rhaney at verizon.net. And finally, let's have a great time and let's learn from one another. Thank Heather? you, Regina. Our session today, Moving to Intentional and Exceptional Governance is presented by Dr. Marco Clark. Dr. Clark is a distinguished Catholic school educator, administrator, and leader who is recognized nationally as an expert in school governance, leadership, and succession planning. Marco holds a doctorate in interdisciplinary leadership from Creighton University. And for the past 30 years, he has served as teacher, administrator, principal, and secondary school president. In 2012, Marco was named a secondary school administrator of the year by the National Catholic Educational Association. And today he currently serves as the first lay executive director of the Holy Cross Institute at St. Edward's University in Austin, Texas. Dr. Clark has published a number of highly regarded articles on Catholic school governance and is a sought after speaker and presenter. It is my pleasure to present my friend and colleague, Dr. Marco Clark. Fantastic. Thank you, Heather, and thank you all for being on here tonight um, and joining us in this series. I'm willing to bet that um, wherever you are in the country, a good percentage of us are dealing with some snow and wind and rain and sleet. Um, I myself, despite the fact that you see beautiful, sunny Austin, Texas in my background, St. Edward's University, I'm actually sitting on the campus at uh, the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana, where it is cold and windy and snowy. And if you should happen to hear the sleet pelleting uh, uh, on my windows, that's what you'll hear in the background. So I welcome you. And I also really just for a moment want to thank um, uh, the folks at LMU, uh, Keith and Sister Rosemary and the team that uh, that helps to put these together. And especially for that joyful, joyful song that we open to. Uh, one of my very favorite human beings on the planet, Sister Anne LaCour, who is the Mother Superior uh, for the, uh, the Marianite Sisters of Holy Cross in New Orleans. Um, I one time asked her about her, she just oozes and emanates joy everywhere she goes, everything she does. And I one time asked her about her joy, where does she find the energy, the spirit? And she said, well, Marco, joy is very simple. It means Jesus, others, and then you, J-O-Y, Jesus, others, and you. And so if you don't remember anything else from tonight's presentation, I hope you remember Sister Anne LaCour and her joyful, joyful witness of Jesus, others, and you. I also am grateful uh, during the opening prayer as we, we prayed for peace, um, peace in our world, uh, certainly peace in the Ukraine, um, peace in our communities, peace in our country, um, peace in our schools peace in our churches, and peace in our homes, and peace in our hearts. Um, 
as I sit here on the campus of the University of Notre Dame, I'm reminded that so many of our uh, Catholic higher education, Catholic colleges and universities in this country and Catholic schools were founded during times of heightened anti-Catholicism. And the moment that we were open, what did we do as a Catholic church? We turned around and we gave a gift back to the world and invited everyone. We stood side by side with all people and invited them into our communities as we built community, communities of joy, communities of hope, communities of the coming kingdom. And so in this world where we see such polarization and division, may we ourselves be those models of communion in our diversity as opposed to discord in our disagreement. And especially as we celebrate this Black History Month, let us remember the celebration of we, of us, of family and communion in our diversity, respect for all peoples. So it's my joy tonight. Um, I really uh, cannot begin to tell you how humbling it is for me to be a member of this panel. Um, when I begin to even think for a moment about the people that are uh, also presenters, the people who came before me, in week one, you heard from Dr. Dale Hoyt and Dr. Camille brown Prevet. Week two, Sister Angela Shaughnessy. Week three, from Dan Curtin and Dr. Ryan Killeen. Um, these were some of my heroes, remain some of my heroes in the Catholic education sector. As someone who is in his 33rd year, I still consider myself very much to be a work in progress. And I look to my role models and my mentors, and these are role models and mentors of mine. My good friend, Heather Gossard, who I had the great pleasure to work 14 years with at, at Bishop McNamara High School in Forestville, Maryland, which you're gonna hear a little bit about our story we woven throughout tonight's presentation. Regina Haney and her vision to put together this program tonight. Regina, thank you uh, for putting together this series and inviting the entire nation to participate free of charge um, in this work of resurrection that we do collectively as shared practitioners. And then of course, Sister Rose Marie, who's been the captain steering the ship, helping us all to make sure that we get started on time, we finish on time and that the technology is delivered properly. So thank you all. And again, it's very, very humbling for me to be with you. So as you heard in the introduction, the presentation that I'm gonna to give tonight, and I'm gonna share my screen. So I hope that you'll be able to see this. And let's get into presentation mode. It's titled Moving to Intentional and Exceptional Governance, the Role of Generative Thinking. And that may be a new term for some of us, and we'll get into that later. But I think there's a couple of caveats that I first want to cover. One is that as we talk about governance, and I believe that Dan Curtin may have talked about this uh, last week, but there's different models of boards, right? There are advisory boards, which many of our parochial schools have. There are boards of limited jurisdiction or specific jurisdiction, which, which are oftentimes referred to as governing boards, right? Sometimes there's two-tiered governing boards where there's um, MOUs or memorandums of understanding with reserved powers for the board of members or a corporate board, and then the board of trustees or your board of directors, those terms will get used interchangeably sometime. As I speak to you tonight, also as a member of the Association of Governing Boards, we're gonna be speaking about specifically, specifically uh, boards of limited jurisdiction. And that's not to say that there isn't something for those of you that have advisory boards, because what I'm gonna challenge us to do is I, I'm gonna challenge our advisory boards to begin thinking about the best practices of effective governance and to move in a direction, right? There's an evolution to this, to move in a direction of change, of engagement, of collective wisdom, of shared governance. And you'll hear me use that term again and again. Just very quickly, if I could, I wanna tell you a little bit about what I do uh, with the Holy Cross Institute at St. Edward's University. So the Holy Cross Institute is an apostolate of the Congregation of Holy Cross, the brothers and priests and sisters of Holy Cross. And we were formed 17 years ago with the exclusive purpose to conduct research, develop resources, and deliver programs to help support Holy Cross educational ministries around the world. There are 120 Holy Cross schools, colleges, and universities in 21 countries. And so uh, our programs are delivered through a variety of media. 
Um, and all of which, and I'm going to drop this into chat for you, if anyone is interested, all of which we make our programs available at no charge. For those of you that are in Texas and Central Texas, uh, we do it. We do in-person events that you're welcome to participate in as well. There's one coming up at the end of March, March 25th and the 26th, uh, with six uh, nationally known speakers, Father James Heft, uh, Carrie Robinson, Gloria Purvis, Dr. Julianne Wallace, Dr. Tom O'Hara, and Chris Lowney. Um, and that's open to all who can attend in person because we will be doing it in, in person. You also see here um, uh, my contact information. If you have any questions uh, after tonight uh, about my presentation, I'd be happy to follow up with you personally. And I saw somebody had dropped in the chat earlier Will there be an opportunity to get the slides? I know that the slides are all being made available through the toolbox that all of you have access to. And so those are slides for tonight's program as well as past programs. Okay, let me. So as we take a look at what you see on the screen, I think some of you are probably very familiar with the term of this is a VUCA world. It's a world where there's lots of volatility, ambiguity, um, uncertainty and complexity. And what's really interesting about this quote that was made in 2012 by Bill Gates, not much has changed in education in the past 150 years, but it will in the next 10. That was 2012. Think about what we've experienced these last two years. And so what I might invite you to do just for a moment is as we think about the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, and the ambiguity of what we face today as society, I'd like for you to drop, start dropping into chat what, those, what these VUCA times have brought us to. What are those things that we're facing in society? I've mentioned one of them already, and that's, that's the polarization, the political polarization that we experience, right? There's racial justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But what are some of the other areas of volatility, ambiguity, complexity, and uncertainty that we face that certainly make their way into our communities? If you would, just take a moment to drop those ideas in the chat. Income inequality and unequal access. Certainly, thank you. Thank you, sister. standards that measured by people who know nothing about our students, mental health from COVID related issues. Thank you, important. The role of technology in education. Size and number of Catholic schools. A model of governance, food inequity. And what's important for us, and the, the reason that I, I just like to take a moment to reflect on that, is that uh, we know, we know these are VUCA times, right? Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous times. And the reality of it is, is that if we continue to do what we've always done, if we continue to address these modern times with the same practices that we've always practiced, right, it's not going to get us to where we need to go. That another way by Albert Einstein. And so what I want to get into a little bit tonight are some adaptive practices in governance, okay? And I'm going to be referring throughout the night to what you'll hear me refer to as adaptive leadership. And some of you are familiar with the research done by, um, by Ron Heifetz and Marty Linsky on adaptive leadership. And, and so we'll be reflecting on that a little bit. But part of it is, is I wanna tell it through a story. And I wanna tell you through the story of Bishop McNamara High School in Forestville, Maryland. I'm a graduate of Bishop McNamara High School. And when I attended this school in the 1980s, the early mid 1980s, it was a school with a thriving population of all boys, grades nine through 12, about 850 students, probably about 80 to 90% of who were Catholic, and I would venture to say about 70% Caucasian and 30% students of color. Over the years that followed from 1985 when I graduated 
to the year 1989, the school had dropped in enrollment from 850 students to a little over 200 students. And there were a lot of reasons that contributed to that, but probably foremost among them were changing demographics in the area. When the school was founded, it was founded in a community that was largely Irish, Italian, Polish, Catholics, who were looking for a place for their Catholic children to go to school. In many ways, they were being sent to Catholic school for some extra discipline. They were being sent to Catholic school for structure. They were being sent to Catholic school for a values-based, faith-based education to give them a leg up in the next step of life. Very middle-class community. And then it began to change to a much more working class and poor to the point to where the zip code that Bishop McNamara High School is located in is the second poorest zip code in the state of Maryland, two miles outside of the city in Southeast DC, four miles right to our nation's capital. And what happened from that 1985 to 1989, 90 period of time as the enrollment dropped from 850 students to 200 students, the response that came from the Brothers of Holy Cross was to form a board of directors. And the role of that board of directors was gonna be to close the school. That was an instruction based on an audit that was occurring. But the board of directors thought otherwise. The board of directors said, you know what? We're gonna fight first. We're gonna do what we can to keep the school open. And so they had to begin thinking creatively and collaboratively. And they worked with the Archdiocese of Washington and they worked with the nearby school, Lorraine, uh, Lorraine Catholic High School, um, which is run by the Bernadine Franciscan Sisters. And they began some dialogue. Should we think about coming together? Should we, what should we do? But the main point of emphasis that I wanna to make tonight is that there was wisdom from the Brothers of Holy Cross to, to create the sponsorship model and establish a governing board. And the governing board was comprised of talented, committed, passionate people who loved the institution, who believed in Catholic education. And they were gonna use their collective creativity in a very heroic way to try to save the school. So they were not gonna close that school, they were gonna save that school. In 1992, the school went co-ed. It did merge with Lorraine High School to become a co-ed school. And immediately it, it doubled in enrollment to about 425 students. And then in 1996, the board faced kind of a new crossroads, an axial moment, if you will. The previous president and the only presidents had served in the role of president at Bishop McNamara High School were religious, were Holy Cross brothers. And now as they looked at their candidate pool, their top candidate was a layperson and a woman, gifted, driven, familiar with the community, celebrated in the Archdiocese of Washington. And that woman was Heather Gossard. And so the board made the selection and the appointment of this gifted leader, this gifted CEO, to build on this already growing legacy. The school was by far from being out of the woods, right? From 1992, when it became co-ed and, and was uh, 415 students, the school began to grow over the years. By 1996, when Mrs. Gossard entered that school, there was about 450 students in it. And it was a period of time where the, some tough decisions had to be made. And the primary responsibility of that board of directors was to provide fiduciary leadership, right? So, so good oversight, good oversight, good decision-making on how resources were expended, proper stewardship, right? And, and times were tight. I came on board with Heather Gossard as the principal in 1997. And I remember taking a walk through the campus and having some concerns about some, some cleanliness or lack of cleanliness and I, you know, some painting needs that needed to be done and some potholes in the parking lot. And I remember Mrs. Gossard saying to me, Marco, we don't even have $30,000 in the bank. We're not gonna be able to do those things right now. So we were far from being out of the woods, but we needed to find a way to grow and create a sustainable model. And we worked with our board in a very strategic fashion where from 1996 to the present day, that school now has 875 students. It doubled in enrollment over the next 10 years. 
and has sustained that ever since. A period of time that went from having $30,000 in the bank to now a school that has its first and growing endowment. A school that had zero credit rating to a school that went to having A plus credit rating and having the creditors come to us and say, what best deal can we give you? A school that had no history of fundraising that over the period of time from 1996 to, to the present day, they've raised now over, we collectively raised now over $30 million and have done over $30 million of new construction, all in the heart of a neighborhood that's the poorest zip code in the state of Maryland, a beacon of hope. Our schools are beacons of hopes, hope in communities, and we should be serving and supporting those communities. In 2010, there was another axial moment. Heather Gossett retired, and it was time to hire a new president. And so the board gathered together in a retreat, and they began to think strategically about the future. What characteristics and qualities do we need to identify in the next leader? And we're going to talk later about the importance of succession planning, right? You as a board, it is a generative opportunity to make sure that you have a succession plan in place. And so in 2010, the board of directors created a succession plan. They identified the attributes and characteristics of, of the next leader. And I was blessed enough to be selected as that next president and CEO. And in my very first meeting with the board chair, he said to me, Marco, this is a moment where we go from good to great to eminent. It's time to go from good to great to eminent. And so we began to think creatively and think innovatively. Um, and, and, and that the board's role, while it maintained its fiduciary responsibility, it began to think much more strategically. And then in 2017, when we were working on a new strategic plan, we formed this new vision statement that it was our vision to create and form empowered leaders who were inspired by the gospel to transform the world. And in order to get to this very simplified vision statement, we went through two years from 2015 to 2017 of retreats and meetings and dream building and what if scenarios and case studies and data collection and, and um, not only looking internally and reflecting backwards on where we've been and how we got here and mistakes that we made along the way, but also looking at best practices around the country. Right, so both an internal and an external scan. These are all forms of generative leadership. And that generative leadership, 2017 to 2020, helped to prepare the school for the unknown, and that was the pandemic. My last act as president at Bishop McNamara High School on March 12th, 2020, was to announce that we would be closing for a couple of weeks to be able to clean and sanitize the building. But we already had a distance learning plan in place something that had been worked on before, right? We're gonna talk later about emergency, about ERM, emergency risk management. How many of your boards have an ERM plan? How many of your boards have ERM, emergent, uh, enterprise risk management, excuse me, enterprise risk management as part of your strategic plan? Well, this board did, and we had this distance learning plan in place. And on Friday, March 12th, 2020, we made that announcement and on Monday, morning, March 15th, we opened up our virtual school, which it remained in for the next 14 months without a loss of enrollment, without a loss of revenue, without a loss of tuition. The school had done its work to prepare for a VUCA world, an unpredictable world. But I think it's important that when we think about effective governance, the number one priority, the number one role of, of effective boards is to make sure that they remain focused on mission, that all decisions are framed around mission. And so it starts with mission. You know, I love this quote. It says, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. The very DNA, the very essence of our schools is captured in our charism. And so whether you're a religious order school or you're a diocesan school, you have a unique charism. But I would ask the question, how many know what your unique charism is? 
How many know why it is that you exist? How many of you know who it is that you're called to serve? How many of us know what makes us unique? What makes us different? What's the value add? All of those things speak to charism. You know what? In the for-profit world, in the corporate world, they call it branding. I I just uh, attended a conference and the the keynote presenter was Father Matt Malone, the editor-in-chief of America Media. And Father Malone said that he used the, the interchangeable terms of brand charism, a generative exercise for boards is to do a deep dive into really understanding with clarity what your unique brand charism is. I'm gonna give some examples a little bit later on on how we reach that point. But I think it's important to understand again, it starts with mission. So Dale Hoyt did a great job in the first session of talking about mission, but I wanna talk about a few things very broadly and I'll go very quickly through this part, but there's some great research that came out of uh, the ACE program at Notre Dame Father Ron Nuzzi, who I'm sure several of you are familiar with, but he said, these are the reasons why Catholic schools are still needed, as he put that in parentheses, right? We create an incarnational view of the world. There's a Catholic worldview that we're teaching through, and we're teaching our students to see God in all things. We are immersing ourselves in the Paschal mystery, and it is a mystery, the mystery of the cross, and the cross is our only hope, Ave Crux Spezunica. What we do in mission is, is recognize the value of relationship as a reflection of the divine, right? Um, what the Jesuits will refer to as cura personalis, or what Pope Francis has referred to cultures of encounter. I like to use the term that in our Catholic schools, we operate on a principle of sacramentality. We, the teachers, you, the board members, and heads of schools, principals and presidents, We are the hands and the feet and the head and the heart and the eyes and the ears of Christ. So each and every day, we are the representation of the unseen, right? Just like the sacraments make visible the invisible God. As well, we teach through this lens of a nuanced view of scripture, I love this quote that comes from my, my tradition with the Congregation of Holy Cross, where Blessed Basil Moreau, our founder, said that education is the art of bringing young people to completeness. The second half of that sentence says, it says to make them more like Christ, to make them more like Christ. What do we do in our Catholic schools? Well, we also teach civic engagement. How can we teach our students to speak with clarity and charity, to listen? to create meeting spaces where they can live with and learn from one another. The world is not giving them a good example of that currently, but we can do that in our schools. There's a service for the common good. I love this quote that says, the first duty of any teacher is to produce Christians. Society has a greater need for people of values than it does scholars. That also comes from Blessed Basil Moreau. And part of my tradition, I'm double Jesuit educated as well. So you'll see Jesuit references here, right? AMDG for the greater glory of God. And then it's through the centrality, the principle of sacramentality as visible through the arts and ritual and drama and music and our life of faith. There's the fullness of Catholic identity at the heart of the church. And of course, there's this personal excellence, this human flourishing to help our students become empowered leaders inspired by the gospel who transform the world. I used to tell my parents at McNamara all the time, you're not paying all this money for your kid to be a follower in life. You're paying all this money for them to become a leader in life. And we're preparing them for that faith-based, ethics, value, virtue-based leadership. What else does the church do? Well, the theme of Catholic education, and this comes from the late Catholics uh, in schools, is implied in the term and should be more insistently for education is one of the great opportunities for the salvific mission of the church. Go back to the most of the origins of the religious orders that are, that are education religious orders. Go back to the origins of most Catholic schools in this country. They were formed in response to the needs of the times where people were broken, there was despair, and there was division. 
And yet this work of resurrection that we do in Catholic education was created so that we could build bridges and build up the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So what do churches do? We should model the church, right? What do churches do? Well, churches pray. Churches love one another. Churches strive for holiness. Isn't that the ultimate end we have for our students? Churches are joyful. Jesus, others, and you. Churches should be peaceful places. There should be places on your campus of solitude. Churches serve, and they serve the community, and they serve one another. Churches teach reverence. We should be teaching reverence in our schools. Churches give respect and dignity for all God's children. We're challenged by that today. The LGBTQ community, we're challenged by that today with racial relations in this country. We're challenged by that today in our own church with traditional Catholics and more progressive liberal Catholics. But what we have to do is we have to teach how to speak with clarity and charity how to create spaces and opportunities for people to gather together and learn with and from each other respectfully. And some research has been done that Catholic schools far exceed what public or independent schools do when it comes to later success in life and pro-social behaviors. So in other words, treating people with kindness and respect, involvement in government and civic activities, involvement in their church and family life. But none of that is accomplished. All of it is wiped out in a Catholic school if the faculty and staff don't show respect and dignity for one another. So part of the role of our boards is making sure that there's a culture that reflects what the church does. And it starts with the example that all of us set, nurturing and supporting, studying the word of God. Christ is at the center and practicing radical hospitality. I think many of us are very familiar with that very recent quote from Pope Francis. I think it's important too, um, as many of you are probably familiar with the national standards and benchmarks for effective Catholic elementary and secondary schools that NCEA has. There's those nine defining characteristics. We're not gonna go into them tonight. There's 13 standards and there's four domains, but in particular domains number one and two are what we're talking about tonight, mission and Catholic identity and governance and leadership. And so what is it? Catholic schools invite young people to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our teaching mission includes inviting young people to a relation with Christ or deepening an existing relationship with Jesus. And then there's governance and leadership. And that's what we're going to talk centrally about tonight. I've highlighted a couple of terms in here. What are the, what's the role of a board to provide direction, authority, and oversight? leadership, ensure effective operations. We need to be seen as well as ministers, as ambassadors, as stewards. And so at this axial moment that we face right now, um, I, I love this image that I have on the screen. If you're not familiar with Pope Francis's book, Lit a Stream, he wrote this book during the pandemic. And he painted for us a path to a better future. And it presents such a hopeful message, but it also says that we can't continue to do what we've always done. That in the time of crises, we're either, you don't, you don't stay the same. You either get better or you get worse, but you do not stay the same during a time of crises. How is it that we will respond to that time of crises? It takes courage to act. And how is it that we act? On the left-hand side, what you see is a picture from the St. John Illuminated Bible, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, see if it's in your city. It's worth going to visit. But what you see there comes from Matthew 25. Our direction on how we should be acting comes from Scripture. It's not rocket science. It's already there for us, right? The Beatitudes, Matthew 25, the example of Christ. And so what I want to do is we're going to take a, a, about seven minutes, okay? I'm going to take about seven minutes. You're going to be broken into some small groups. And hearing what you just heard about mission, I want you to reflect and share on these questions together, okay? Identify, and this work, by the way, these questions come out of a great book by Patrick Lencioni, who, by the way, is a Catholic author. 
and offers extraordinary services and support for Catholic schools. A lot of you might be familiar with his organization called the Table Group, um, but they also have an organization for Catholic uh, organizations and parishes called Amazing Parish. And so if you just Google Amazing Parish, you'll be able to see some of the resources which he makes free and accessible to you. But this is part of what we want to ask you to do, is we want you to just sit and talk with your neighbor, there's going to be three or four of you in a group, and see if you can identify with clarity why your school exists. And then begin to think about, well, what behaviors define your school? And I'm not necessarily talking about what um, aspirational behaviors de define your school. What behaviors define your school right now? And then ask yourself the question, well, what do we do? Well, you might think, well, gosh, we, we provide Catholic education, but do a deeper dive on that, right? In what way do we do what we do? And then also maybe think, what does the best version of ourselves look like? Then what does success look like? And how do we even measure that? And then I want you to think about what's most important for your school right now. And then what do you need to do to achieve those goals, right? So a lot in seven minutes but I think it's good to hear from one another. So um, Keith, if we can go ahead and, and divide people up in their breakout groups at this time, I would appreciate it. We're gonna cut and paste these same questions into your chat as soon as you get into the breakout room. We'll see you back here in seven minutes. Alrighty, everyone, you should be getting a prompt right now. We have anybody in the room um, who cannot get into a breakout room, please just uh, message me and we will get you into a room.
Mr. Clark, this is a heads up. You have about two and a half minutes left in the first breakout session. Thank you very much, Keith. We are now on the final 60 seconds of the breakout room. Thank you. Everybody should be filling in within the next 60 seconds. Right, we have everybody joined back now. All righty, fantastic. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. I know, as uh, you indicated in chat, several of you indicated, we really wish we had more time in breakout groups. This is going great. And I, too, wish you had more time. I, I really wanted to do that exercise just to sort of um, I whet your appetite a little bit, frankly. Um, it is a stimulating exercise to do, right? And this is an exercise that you should be doing together as a board with your administration, right? And it's also an exercise that your administrative leadership team should be doing together themselves away from the board, right? And it could be an exercise that every department in a school, so if we're talking about a secondary school that has multiple academic departments and, and programs and student support services, et cetera, it's a way to begin to think with clarity around those very core principles of why is it that we even exist? What is it that we do? How is it that we do it? What values are important to us, right? And, and how do we measure success? How do we know that we've become effective at this? I just came off of a three-day conference. Uh, and as I mentioned before, Father Matt Malone, the um, CEO of America Media, 
um, was the keynote presenter. And he talked about this very process of, of brand charism, engagement, and their strategic planning, or in the term that he used, envisioning process. How do you envision the future for your institution? And the reason that is so important is that, again, let's go back to what I just said, what I said in the very beginning of this. If we continue to do the same things we've always done in governance, then we're going to get the same things that we've always gotten in governance. We, you invite people to be a part of your board who think creatively, who think strategically, who think critically, who are, who are smart, who care, who are passionate. But I have to ask the question, how engaged are they really? And are they focused on the right things? Right. If you're spending time at your board meetings talking about the traffic flow pattern in your parking lot, then your board's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Right. On the other hand, if you're thinking about how to strategically place yourselves, position yourself in the next five years and 25 years, now your board is doing more of what it needs to be doing. So this next segment, we're going to talk about what the really basic principles of trusteeship are. And these come out of um, two sources that at the end, you'll see where all these sources are. But one of them comes from a book called Governance as Leadership. OK, excuse me, Leadership as Governance. And then the, um, the second one is coming from a, a set of materials produced by the Association of Governing Boards. I'm a member of the Association of Governing Boards. And, and uh, that graphic that you see there on your screen comes from the Associative Go uh, Association of Governing Boards and reminds us that as a board, these are the three things that we do. We lead by example, we understand governance. And what that means is, is if, if we have to understand governance, it means we have to learn and study and get better at governance. There's an education component to being a board member too. And there's an education component that you as heads of school are responsible to help educate your boards about effective governance. And then what is it that we do? We think strategically. But in order to even think strategically to get from point A to point B, we have to understand the frame, which ultimately is our brand charism or our mission, right? All decisions should be made through that lens or framed in mission. But again, I would challenge you, how clearly do people understand your mission? Most mission statements are filled with glossy language. Most mission statements are not operationalized, right? They're not operationalized. They exist. They might sit on your shelf and collect dust. There might be a beautiful picture that hangs on the wall in the main office. But how well do people in and through your organization know that mission? And is it something that they can put into practice every single day? It takes time to get to that point, but it's worth spending the time. And so I mentioned earlier the research of Heifetz, Grasho, and Linsky that talks about adaptive organizations, right? And what adaptive organizations do is, is they, um, they name the elephants in the room. Right? They're unafraid to name the elephants in the room, but sometimes before you can even get to the point of naming the elephants in, in the room without offending people, how to speak with clarity and charity. I'm gonna go back to that statement again. How do you speak with clarity and charity? As that your board, you as a board have to establish an identity. You have to learn to trust each other. You have to love each other and you have to all know that you're all focused towards the same set of goals and principles and mission. And when you're at that point, which Patrick Lencioni, again, has great research on how to get to that point, then an effective board can name the elephants in the room, right? They can assign responsibility to various parties on the organization's future, and they understand that that's shared. They'll be willing to think independently, but they understand that, that ultimately we're deciding together a president of a university for a board that I serve on said that it's important to do these things. He said, you look four times, you listen three times, you speak twice only if necessary, and you decide once, right? And then we understand that that's a collective decision that's made. And so with boards that are adaptive, they also understand that they're continuously learning. One of the most stimulating parts of one of the boards that I serve on is a medical, medical school board. And they start off every single meeting with us collectively reading the mission, the vision, and the philosophy of that organization so that we all know. And then we actually go over the norms of how our board operates. 
It took time to get there, but it's worth spending the time. It's engaging, right? They provide education for us ongoing. And that's part of the role. That's part of the job that we have as heads of school. And so under those three categories of, of uh, understanding governance, right, embracing the, embracing the full scope of our responsibilities, understanding what they are, respecting the difference between the board's role and the administration's role, right? Sometimes boards, we'll get into this a little bit later, but sometimes they get too far into the weeds, right? You hired some, a capable person and put them in place to be a decision maker. You have a particular role in that, but you're not there to be the decision maker. You're not there to be in the weeds, you're also there to be an ambassador for your school, right? And for Catholic education as a whole. And then you have to lead by example, which is conducting ourselves with the utmost integrity, thinking independently and acting collectively. And we have to be representatives of champions of justice, equity, and inclusion. And then as well, thinking strategically. In order to think strategically, we have to learn about the mission, culture, constituents, and context. We have to focus on what matters for long-term sustainability, and we have to ask smart questions. We have to ask smart questions. And so what is it that governance means? These are the things that we do as trustees. We're guardians. We monitor. We think strategically. We're engaged. And there's a level of accountability that we have to the institution, that we have to one another, and that the leadership has to you, right? They say that in any effective democratic society, the leaders need to be accessible, they need to be transparent, and they need to be accountable. And so part of what I'd love to challenge boards to do is ask yourself the question, after you finish a board meeting, right? Sometimes here it is, we meet, we meet a couple of times per year, four or five times per year, maybe you meet 10 times per year. We're gonna talk in a minute about really what the ideal number is. But do you ever report out to your constituent, to your community about what happened at the board meeting? The things that you can share, that's a method of being transparent. Do you ever set up days where the board comes during the school day instead of like this clandestine group of decision makers that meets mysteriously in the middle of the night in the school library? Who are the board members? How engaged are they in the community, right? So let's make sure that our leadership, the board, the governors of your organization are accessible, right? And there's some parameters around that accessibility. Two, there's transparency. And three, there's accountability. These are basic board responsibilities. Determine mission and purpose, select, support, evaluate the principal or the head of school, ensure effective planning, monitor and strengthen programs and services, ensure adequate financial resources, protect assets and provide financial oversight, build a competent board, Right? This is a part that's so overlooked by boards. You should always be thinking about how can we add to enhance this board with new members of the board, right? And you don't just keep adding for, for, for the sake of adding new people, right? That becomes unwieldy. There is an ideal size of a board. We'll get into that. But ultimately you have to be thinking about, okay, this person is gonna roll off the board. What talents or skills do we have? And I think there's a later presentation in this webinar series about how to identify and prepare for that board cycle. You have a legal, you, you have a responsibility to ensure legal and ethical integrity of the organization and to enhance the school's public standing. So in the structure, does your board have committees, right? The best, most effective boards should have three to five core important committees, a finance committee, right? Do you have a principal support and evaluation committee? Do you have a mission and governance committee? And then sometimes there'll be committees on advancement, plant facilities, right? Committees is where the heavy lifting is where you do get further into the weeds. That's where the, the heavy lifting should take place. The board should be at the 30,000 foot level committees will get down into the weeds more. And then you have to create an agenda, share the agenda in advance, and then be committed to following that agenda. I would also argue that part of what we need to do with the agenda is to eliminate reports, right? You can put your reports in writing and send it to everybody in advance. And board members, you should do your homework, make sure that you've read those reports. And then just take time for questions or reflection on those reports. 
in order to build in time into your board meeting to think generatively and to think strategically and to engage board members. If all you're doing is reading reports, a board member sits there and I will tell you that they'll be disengaged, right, in many ways and, and, and they'll be unfulfilled or unrewarded and they'll wonder, why did you even invite me on this board? Why do I even serve on this board if we never get a chance to discuss, to listen, to prepare strategically for the future? And then take a look at your bylaws, right? Reviewing your annual bylaws should be done annually. It's a good exercise for a board to go through. Is there anything that we need to tweak or change, right? But one of the big keys is, is look at terms and term limits. I go to some board meetings where I hear somebody has been on the board for 16 years, right? That person's been chair of the board for 12 years. That's not healthy for an organization. Typical term limits are three years. Most often, board members can do two back-to-back terms, so six years total. One of the boards I serve on is you can do back-to-back-to-back, so three terms of three years, up to nine years, right? So establish terms and term limits. That churn is good for the organization. And then what about the size? They say that the ideal size of a board is between 12 members and 22 members. When you get bigger than 22, there is the proper care and feeding of boards that becomes very difficult. There are too many people that can sit in a room with 22 people and sort of disappear and never get their voice heard and never engage. The other hand, if you go below 12, then you begin to really impact the diversity of thought, right? So 12 to 22, they say, is the ideal size of a board. And then how often should you meet, right? Frankly, governing boards shouldn't have to meet any more than four or five times a year. And in between those four or five meetings, their committees should be meeting, right? So now you may still have eight or 10 meetings a year, but the board at the governance level is only meeting four or five times a year. And then there's part of this cycle of how do we find, uh, what is the board building cycle, right? We're identifying new members. We're cultivating relationships with new members. We're recruiting new members all the time. We're properly orienting those members. We get those members engaged. We help to educate those members and then they rotate off. We evaluate, important to evaluate yourselves every year. I just finished a board evaluation for the university, the medical school that I serve on. Important to evaluate, hear the voices from other board members about your effectiveness. And you continue that cycle, identifying new, cultivating, recruiting, orienting, engaging, educating, rotating, and evaluating. And how to recruit for high value board work, right? We we have to go out and we share our distinct mission and values. I think sometimes what a lot of schools do is, is they only think about alumni and parents as board members, but begin to think about who in the community are leaders in the community that might be attracted to your unique mission and values and can be of service to that board. Maybe it's the local bank. Maybe it's somebody in a marketing department, one of the local companies, right? Trying to engage yourself with some of the, with the local community, right? As well, when you're recruiting for high value board work, if you wanna get top board members, go in with a conversation and emphasize their work and uh, their strategic and generative work. Right? So as a board member, you're not just inviting them to sit there and, and, and be a rubber stamp. Right? You're asking them to engage. You're inviting them to share their gifts and their creativity and their decision making to help drive the school forward. And then you want to recruit based on how people think rather than what they do. I do think it's important to do an evaluation of what your needs are. We need lawyers. Right? Um, in, in years where we were doing construction, it helped to have people on our board that, that were maybe co- uh, connected with the planning board in the county or have people that were engineers or architects, right? It helped with those sorts of things. So it's good to have people from those backgrounds and fields, but more importantly than that is, are they gonna be driven by the mission? Do they wanna be strategic thinkers? How is it that they think, right? Creative, uh, uh, creatively and, and diversely. And then you would want to illustrate for these prospective board members that what they're going to be doing is meaningful and consequential. The orientation is so critical. It is so critical. And it's one of the most overlooked parts of boards. 
right? I've been to orientations where I arrived 10 minutes before the rest of the board. And I sat there for two years before I figured out really what my role was on that board. On, a, on the other hand, there were very well-developed orientations where I was able to hit the ground running from meeting one and was productive and engaged for the next six years. Right, these are all elements of what you might include in the orientation. I think it's gonna be covered as well in one of the later webinars. And so part of it is setting expectations, letting the board members know this is a board of choice. They have homework to do. We need to let them know up front that there is a philanthropic component to this. We don't need to say there's a board minimum. We don't need to say there's a get, give or get off clause. We do need to say that we, we hope that they will make, they'll establish your organization as one of their top three philanthropic endeavors and make an annual gift. And if there's any type of special appeal or campaign that they'll participate in that at whatever level they can, 100% participation is the goal. And I think it's important in recruiting board members that they hear this before they even come on the board. Let them know that it's a board of dialogue and dissent, that we're going to assess ourselves, that we're focused on mission, that ultimately we're going to be a united front. We, we have to be confidential, maintain confidentiality. We also have to be advocates and ambassadors for the institution. And so you, you'll get these notes, and I won't spend time going through these because I want to value the time we have left for the third part. And I think we're going to go ahead and take Keith five minutes to go into breakout groups again. And you can see this set of questions. But what I really like for you to think about is the question, third from the last question that says, um, what is the single most important question that your board needs to be addressing in the next 12 to 18 months? Right. It's good to reflect on all these other things. Do your board members know their responsibilities? Do you have a board handbook? Do you conduct a board orientation or retreat? Do you have board policies and procedures, right? Do you evaluate those annually? Should, what should you start doing, stop doing and keep doing, right? Are you mission and strategy driven, right? But then let's really talk about what's the single most important question that you need to address in the next 10, 12 to 18 months. We're gonna cut this down to five minutes so that we can save time at the end for the final part on generative thinking. All right, Keith, all yours. All right, everybody, you should receive a prompt now.
think we have about two minutes left in this session. Okay, they have 20 seconds left in the breakout rooms and then a 60 second uh, load back in. So. Thank you, Keith. And Marco, we have about 15 minutes left in the session. Great, thank you, Heather. Ready, you may begin. All righty, thank you and welcome back everybody. So let me just say first and foremost, oh, I apologize that we can't spend more time diving deeper into each of those areas and, and giving you more time in the breakouts. Typically when this, you know, tonight we have about 75 minutes together. Um, this is the sort of operation and the sort of um, um, framework that I would spend an entire day with a board retreat on a board retreat with. And so um, we're cramming it down into these 75 minutes. But again, uh, Keith has dropped into your chat, the toolbox, you have access to this. Um, PowerPoint presentation with my notes attached to it as well. Um, I hope that you refer to it. As we get into the last 15 minutes, and again, I'm gonna remain respectful to everybody's time and we will wrap up in 15 minutes. So we're gonna go fast, but I'm gonna be referring often to this book, Governance is Leadership by Chate, Ryan and Taylor. And we'll look at these three modes of governance that you've heard me talk a little bit about already. And what are those modes, right? So there's fiduciary, strategic and generative. So the fiduciary role is the board as oversight, strategic is board as direction setter, generative is board as meaning maker, okay? That's the framing that we speak about. And I would ask you though, what percentage of time do you spend on each of these? The triangle that's there shows equal sides, equal amount of time. And that's not an easy thing to accomplish. It takes changing the way we do things in our agenda, right? In order to leave time for strategic thinking and generative thinking, there should be an education component to every board meeting. 
right? Um, and so uh, often, as most boards do, they operate on a report only basis, maybe some questions asked, a rubber stamp approval given, and then they close out the night, right? You wanna get the best out of your board, then we have to change that script. We have to completely rewrite that script. Provide an opportunity for mission, what I like to call a mission moment. Provide opportunity for education. Provide opportunity for generative thinking and then get to your reports, right? Not an easy thing to do. And I'm gonna give you some examples tonight on generative thinking. So fiduciary, please pardon the pictures on here, but I do get these crack me up. You oftentimes hear in the fiduciary role of boards is that you should have your noses in, but your fingers out. You should be nosing in and looking at the finances. You should be asking all of the right questions, right? But keep your fingers out. That's what you have management to do, right? All right. I won't keep that on your screen too long. Then there's the strategic, that's the foresight, that's the planning, that's getting from point A to point B, that's getting from the, the current present to the desired future. And then there's generative thinking, right? Before we can really get from our point A to point B, we have to understand point A, right? We have to understand point A. And so when it comes to generative thinking, a couple of quotes that I'll leave with you that I think are just so important. This comes from Jeffrey Pfeffer says that establishing the framework within which issues will be viewed and decided is often tantamount to determining the result. If this is true, then little, if anything, could be more important to your school than the conception of generative thinking. Strategy development helps us to get from here to there, from the present point A to the future preferred B point B, but understanding point A must come first. That's understanding who you are, who you serve, why you exist. It's about asking questions before strategy. It's exploring why before how. It's getting on a balcony level and looking down that 30,000 foot level and looking down in order to interpret. It's listening, it's reflecting, it's possibility thinking, it's discerning. So how do we know what a generative opportunity is? Some generative opportunities are ones that we can put into practice ourselves. And I'm gonna show that to you on the next slide. Others are opportunities where, uh, where there's a representation of, of ambiguity, issues of saliency, issues of high stakes, strife or irreversibility. So for example, in, in the wake of the George Floyd killings two years ago, Schools needed to respond to systemic racism, racial injustices. How to do that is a conversation that, right, there's some ambiguity. Certainly there's saliency, there's high stakes. There's gonna be lots of emotion. There could be potential strife. And how you approach that could be irreversible. That's an opportunity. You can spot a generative opportunity if it fits into one or more of these categories. The types of generative thinking that you can be doing on your own to help train your mind, to help train your board to be generative thinkers. If the only time you're asking your board to respond, to be generative and strategic thinkers is when they're responding in crises, they're not going to be in the habit of doing that. So we have to create the habit of being generative thinkers. Some of that means us being proactive, right? And the research I did for my doctorate at Creighton University on succession planning, we found and CEA reported that 65% of Catholic schools did not have a succession plan. Association of Governing Boards has found that 75% of colleges and universities in the United States do not have an enterprise risk management plan. So making succession planning and enterprise risk management as a generative opportunity is how you're helping to prepare for the long-term future and making sure that you know and you can quickly respond to risk as you encounter it. It also is taking opportunities to learn from the past. So let's look back as Bishop McNamara did, let's look back to 1989 
How is it that we didn't see from 1985 to 1989 going from 850 students to 212 students? What factors contributed to that? What can we learn from that? So looking retrospectively at your own history, then there's the opportunity to role play various scenarios. How would we handle such and such? You can review case studies. You can do some problem solving together. You can look through the lens of various perspectives. How does this particular situation or issue or decision, how is it from a student's perspective, from a parent's perspective, from a single parent's perspective, from your faculty and staff member's perspective, from your working parent, working faculty or staff member who has children of their own, right? When decisions were being made around how to respond to COVID, oftentimes schools forgot about those teachers who also were parents and had to figure out, well, how am I gonna handle quarantine and teach my class while my kids here as well need to get be schooled and they're, they're doing it online, right? So we have to choose these salient opportunities to look through various diverse lenses. We have to take surveys, collect data, learn from the data, explore that data so that we can make sense of it. There's a great book that was written by Tim Yule, and some of you might be familiar with Dr. Yule's work on Catholic School Matters. But this book, um, uh, Orchestrating Conflict, has 10 chapters, case studies in Catholic school leadership. I would challenge you as a board to get this book, to choose a case study, and to spend time on that case study yourselves. How would you respond? You're getting into the habit of generative thinking. As well, Governance as Leadership gives you all sorts of examples of good generative thinking and case studies and questions. Some of those questions are right here. What three adjectives best describe or characterize your school? What will be most strikingly different about your school in five years? These are all generative questions that your board can be spending time on exploring. What do you hope will be most strikingly different about your school in five years? So the first one says, what will be most strikingly different? And then the next one is, what do you hope is gonna be most different? If there were a list that you could create, would you like your school to rank at the top of that list? What is that list? Five years from today, what were your school's key constituents consider the most important legacy of your board, of the board that you serve on? What will be the most, what will be most different about the board or how we govern in five years? How would we respond if a donor gave us $50 million Right, a $50 million endowment to the one school that had the best idea for becoming a valuable public asset. What would that valuable public asset be for you? And maybe the question would be is, is what if a donor gave you $50 million and had some restrictions on it and, and you had to wrestle with some of those restrictions, maybe challenging your mission, maybe challenging your core, maybe challenging your integrity and your ethics. How might you respond to that? I was on a board one time that received a multi-million dollar gift from a known mob boss. And that mob boss wanted his name on a building. If you were offered a multi-million dollar gift, how would your board respond to that, right? If you were to pick up a paper, if there's gonna be such a thing in 25 years, if you were to pick up a newspaper 25 years from now, what headline would you like to read about your school? That's a fun exercise to do as a board. It's a fun exercise to do with your faculty. What has one of your competitors done successfully that you would not choose to do as a matter of principle? What have we done that a competitor might not do as a matter of principle? What headline would we least like to see our school and most like to see about our school? And then what's the biggest gap right now that exists between what your school claims to do and what it actually is doing. These are all examples of generative questions that you can spend five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an entire board retreat around. Advantages of generative thinking are many, right? It means that your board is empowered to do meaningful work. It engages their collective minds, right? It increases their engagement. It allows for diverse thinking. It increases your creativity. That's the adaptive thinking that Heifetz and Linsky talked about. It enables the board and the school to be better prepared for the what ifs, 
It enriches the work of board members. It enhances the overall board's value. It builds trust and transparency. And the thing that I didn't put on here, it will increase the financial donations that your board members make to your school because they are engaged. They've been given purpose. And so there is an important relationship between the principal or president and the board, especially with the board chair, right? That could be a whole other, whole other workshop. And I've, I've given that workshop before. There's this cycle of successful governance, right? If you increase engagement, the board recognizes that they're crucial and they're a generative source of leadership. You will increase your intellectual capital, your school's reputational capital, your political capital in the community, and your social capital, and as I mentioned before, your financial capital. And so the work that we do in Catholic education, I come back to mission, right? We, it is a work of resurrection. It's meant to be a liberation from the darkness of ignorance. It's meant to be a vehicle for the transformation of society. And it's meant to be a process that helps make all things, especially the persons engaged in it, new. That includes board members, right? Them becoming new. I, I saw a wonderful presentation done several years ago by uh, Tom Kiley, my good friend, Tom Kiley. And he said he, he used the parable of new wine and old wine skins to talk about adapting to the changes that we, have fa that we face in Catholic education. Are you trying to put new wine and old wine skins, right? We need to be thinking innovatively and creatively, disruptively. And I would urge you that with the eyes of faith, consider the greatness of your mission and the wonderful amount of good which you can accomplish You've got an entire reference list of where I drew these resources from and some recommendations for additional reading. You'll have some contact information for me if anybody has any questions and would like to reach out. And I just really, again, want to thank the folks at Loyola Marymount University and Regina Haney and my colleagues from Loyola Marymount, Creighton, of course, at my school, St. Edwards and Mount St. Mary's. And I just encourage you and pray that you'll continue to be disciples with hope to bring. So may God bless you all. I'll turn it back over to Regina, whomever, to close us Heather. out. Heather. Heather. Marco, thank you. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Marco, thank you so much. Obviously, if you've been looking in the chat room, uh, you know the enthusiasm that our participants have had for the uh, presentation that you shared tonight. Thank you so much. We urge all of you now to access the chat room in order to complete your session evaluation. And Regina, I know you also have our final reminder for tonight. Yes, yes. And uh, I'm thinking all the wonderful information, Marco, and what will my next board agenda look like mm -hmm. that will reflect all these wonderful thoughts tonight. So thank you. Um, we look forward to seeing all of you on March 10th for another outstanding presentation on strategic planning uh, presented by Dan Ryan and Ryan Killian. So until we gather again as a community of faith and learning, stay safe and well, and may God bless you and the good that you do in God's holy name. Thank you all so much. We'll see you March 10th.